Let us discuss about some important disorders of liver in children and what we need to know from them for our MCQs. Okay. So, we will be discussing this under these main headings. So, we will be discussing a little bit about some important disorders where we get unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in children, some important disorders where we get conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. We will be discussing a little bit about portal hypertension in children, okay, viral hepatitis in children and Wilson disease. So, starting with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, Some important conditions where we get unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia we can get mainly due to two conditions. One, they can I, it can either be due to increased production of bilirubin, okay. So, it can either be due to increased production of bilirubin. or it can be due to decreased conjugation of bilirubin, okay. increased production or decreased conjugation. Okay. Now, increased production of bilirubin is mainly seen in hemolytic disorders, okay. hemolytic disorders. Right. Or it can be seen in disorders where there is ineffective erythropoiesis like in thalassemias, okay, megaloblastic anemia, ineffective erythropoiesis. Right. Decreased conjugation of bilirubin can be seen in certain conditions like the Gilbert syndrome and the Krigler-Nazar syndrome, which has got the Krigler-Nazar syndrome has got a type 1 and a type 2, okay. So, decreased conjugation we can get mainly in Gilbert syndrome, Krigler-Nazar syndrome, so we can get decreased conjugation in Gilbert syndrome and Krigler Nazar syndrome, which has got a type 1 and a type 2. Okay. Now, Gilbert syndrome, you know, is as such a very mild condition. The bilirubin level is usually less than 4 milligram per dl. So, Gilbert syndrome is a mild condition, but the bilirubin levels may increase during stress or it can be precipitated. So, increase during stress fasting, fatigue, okay. So, there is mild deficiency of the UDP glucuronyl transferase enzyme, okay. UDP glucuronyl transferase enzyme, not a very severe condition. Now, Krigler-Nazar syndrome has got types 1 and 2. Type 1 is a very severe condition where there is complete absence of the UDP glucuronyl transferase enzyme, okay complete absence of UDP glucuronyl transferase enzyme and this has got a recessive inheritance while type 2 is a milder illness okay where there is some amount of enzyme activity is still present okay so it is a milder illness with decreased UDP glucuronyl transferase enzyme. So, this type 2 usually has autosomal dominant inheritance with variable penetrance. Okay. So, these are some important disorders where you get unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in children. Moving on to some important causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, you know the detailed enumeration of important causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia we have done in the section on neonatal jaundice. 
So you may refer to the section on neonatal jaundice for detailed enumeration of different causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Okay. So we will be discussing a little bit about some of the important conditions that we mentioned there. So some of the important conditions about which we need to know a little are Dubin Johnson syndrome. So Dubin Johnson syndrome here, there it is a condition where there is impaired excretion of the conjugated bilirubin. Okay. So impaired excretion of conjugated bilirubin due to mutation in canalicular multi drug resistant protein 2 multi drug resistance protein 2 and you know in dubin johnson syndrome there is a dark pigmentation of liver remember d for dubin johnson d for dark dark pigmentation of liver okay A little bit about rotor syndrome. So in rotor syndrome, there is decreased hepatic uptake, storage as well as excretion of bilirubin. So there is decreased hepatic uptake and storage and decreased biliary excretion of bilirubin. Decreased biliary excretion of bilirubin. Okay. There is another condition known as PFIC which is seen in children as a cause of conjugated jaundice. PFIC is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. Progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. This refers to a group of conditions where we see severe cholestatic jaundice beginning in early childhood. So severe cholestatic jaundice beginning in childhood. There are three types of this progressive familial cholestasis of which the GGT enzyme level is elevated only in type 3. Okay. GGT gamma glutamyl transferase enzyme level elevated only in PFIC type 3. Okay. Not elevated in types 1 and 2. Okay. A very, very important cause of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in infants is biliary atresia. Okay, neonates and infants, a very, very important cause is biliary atresia, also known as extrahepatic biliary atresia. What is the screening test for detection of biliary atresia? So, the screening test is called HIDA scan or hepatic scintigraphy. HIDA scan or hepatic scintigraphy. Okay. It is a nuclear scan where you know we look at the excretion of bilirubin into the intestine. Right. Now remember this biliary atresia. The surgery that is usually done for biliary atresia is called Kasai's procedure. So, we will not be going into the details of the surgery. But you know one thing that I would like to mention that this Kasai procedure has good outcome or prognosis only if it is done within 8 weeks age. If you delay the surgical process later than this, then the prognosis or outcome is not very good. Okay. So, better prognosis if done at less than 8 weeks of age. 
Another important point to remember is this biliary atresia is the most common indication of liver transplantation in children. Okay. So, most common indication of liver transplantation in children is again biliary atresia. You know, in the neonatal period, a very close differential diagnosis of biliary atresia is neonatal hepatitis. It is very, very important to distinguish between these two conditions, neonatal hepatitis where surgery will not be required and biliary atresia where surgery is required. So, you know, it is a very, very important to distinguish between these two very important causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia seen during neonatal period or early infancy. So, let us see what are the important differences between neonatal hepatitis and biliary atresia. Okay, how do we distinguish these two conditions? Now, onset, if we look at the onset of illness, Neonatal hepatitis can begin any time in the neonatal period, any time in neonatal period. While biliary atresia is usually evident by the end of first week of life, usually evident by end of first week of life. Okay, the severity of jaundice, okay, if we talk about the severity of jaundice. In neonatal hepatitis disease, it is mild to moderate jaundice. Mild to moderate jaundice. While in biliary atresia, it is moderate to severe jaundice. Moderate to severe jaundice. Okay. If you look at the color of stool, so clinically, you can distinguish using these pointers. So, if we look at the color of stool, it can be variable in neonatal hepatitis. Okay, color of stool may be variable in neonatal hepatitis. While in biliary atresia, as there is an obstruction to the drainage of bilirubin, the stool will be clay colored or pale colored. Okay. Now, coming to some investigations. If we look at the alkaline phosphatase level, alkaline phosphatase levels. These are usually not very increased in neonatal hepatitis. So, these are usually normal in neonatal hepatitis. While in biliary atresia, the alkaline phosphatase levels are increased. Okay. If we look at the abdominal ultrasound, if we do an ultrasound of the abdomen, neonatal hepatitis as such, we do not get anything specific but it can the abdominal ultrasound can help to identify any obstruction if there is present to the drainage of bilirubin. So, identifies so if you know some stones are there in the biliary tract that means choledocal ethiasis or choledocal cyst if it is there. So, it identifies choledocal ethiasis or choledocal cysts if they are there but as such no role in neonatal hepatitis. But biliary atresia you get a triangular cord sign on ultrasound. Triangular cord sign. Okay. Then as we already mentioned, there is a screening test that is known as HIDA scan, which is useful in distinguishing these two conditions. So, there is a HIDA scan which can be done. So, in HIDA scan in neonatal hepatitis, you can see biliary excretion in the intestine. So, biliary, so you can see the radioactivity in the intestine. So, radioactivity seen in intestine. While in case of biliary atresia, no radioactivity is seen in intestine because you know the bile cannot reach the intestine. So, no radioactivity in intestine. Okay. Liver biopsy is a very valuable process in distinguishing these two conditions. So, if you do a liver biopsy, 
in liver biopsy in neonatal hepatitis we see distortion of the lobular architecture okay distortion of lobular architecture and we can get giant cells and inflammatory infiltrates okay giant cells and infl inflammation evidence of inflammation while in biliary atresia you get bile ductular proliferation okay so bile ductular proliferation and portal or periportal edema and fibrosis but the lobular architecture is maintained so you can get portal or periportal portal or perilobular edema and fibrosis another very useful investigation is per operative cholangiogram so operative cholangiogram operative cholangiogram is usually normal in neonatal hepatitis but in biliary atresia it will determine the presence or absence of atresia okay depending on so whether you know it die the thing that you're injecting is getting excreted in the intestine or not okay so it usually determines the presence as well as size and location okay presence and size of obstruction okay so this is how you distinguish between two very very important causes of neonatal or infantile jaundice that is neonatal hepatitis and biliary atresia and it is very important to distinguish between two because biliary atresia the sooner you do the surgery the better the prognosis or the outcome let us discuss a little bit about portal hypertension in children now so what do you mean by portal hypertension in children so portal hypertension in children is defined as elevation of portal pressure more than 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury okay and it can be due to an obstruction anywhere in the you know portal venous system okay so it can be due to obstruction to portal blood flow anywhere along the course of portal venous system course of portal venous system so you know important causes of portal hypertension in children we can divide them into prehepatic or pre sinusoidal intrahepatic or sinusoidal and post hepatic or post sinusoidal causes okay so let us discuss some important causes of portal hypertension in children so coming to the prehepatic or also known as pre sinusoidal causes So this is basically due to obstruction to the portal vein, obstruction in the portal vein due to any reason, okay. So due to the obstruction in portal vein, so due to portal vein obstruction from any cause. Portal vein thrombosis is the most common cause of this extra hepatic portal venous obstruction, okay. Portal vein thrombosis. Is the most common cause. Of extra hepatic portal hypertension. Okay. Now this cause of portal vein thrombosis may vary depending on the age of the child. 
so in neonates you know sepsis of the umbilical cord stem that means omphalitis or umbilical vein catheterization may predispose to it okay so in neonates okay it can be associated with omphalitis that means infection of the umbilical cord stem okay and there can be history of umbilical venous catheterization or dehydration or sepsis can predispose to it okay dehydration sepsis in older children infections of the abdominal structures okay older children intra abdominal infections like appendicitis peritonitis okay inflammatory bowel disease appendicitis peritonitis inflammatory bowel disease hypercoagulable states like you know protein c protein s deficiency factor 5 laden they can predispose to it okay so remember the most common cause of portal hypertension in children is extra extra hepatic portal venous obstruction most common cause of portal hypertension in children is extra hepatic portal venous obstruction extra hepatic portal venous obstruction okay so these are some pre hepatic or pre sinusoidal causes now moving on to some intra hepatic or sinusoidal causes so intra hepatic or sinusoidal causes the most important cause of intra hepatic or most important most common intra hepatic cause of portal hypertension in children is cirrhosis okay most common intra hepatic cause of portal hypertension in children is cirrhosis important causes of cirrhosis in children include biliary atresia chronic viral hepatitis chronic viral hepatitis autoimmune hepatitis and metabolic liver disease okay in some children we can get non cirrhotic portal fibrosis okay in some children so not very common but in some children we can get non cirrhotic portal fibrosis so these are some intra hepatic or sinusoidal causes moving on to some post hepatic or post sinusoidal causes this includes mainly two entities one is bacchiari syndrome and another is veno occlusive disease
Okay. A little bit about Bacchiari syndrome first. Bacchiari syndrome is basically due to obstruction to the hepatic veins. So, due to obstruction to hepatic veins. Or hepatic venous system anywhere between the efferent hepatic veins, anywhere between the efferent hepatic veins to the entry of inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So, anywhere in that course, if there is obstruction, okay, to the entry of inferior vena cava into right atrium. Okay. So, this Bacchiari syndrome can be due to hypercoagulable state. So, it can be due to hypercoagulable state like we already mentioned protein C, protein S deficiency, factor V laden, okay, homocystinuria. So, hypercoagulable state or it can be due to some malignancy or it can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease or it can be associated with conditions like Besset syndrome. Okay. Now a little bit about veno-occlusive disease. So, this veno-occlusive disease is the most common cause it is the most common cause of hepatic venous obstruction in children. Okay. What happens here is there is occlusion of the centrilobular venules. So, there is occlusion of centrilobular venules. or sublobular hepatic veins. And you know this veno-occlusive disease occurs most, more frequently in transplant recipients. Okay? It occurs most frequently in bone marrow transplant recipients. after total body irradiation. Okay. So, these are some important causes of portal hypertension in children. A little bit about the clinical presentation of portal hypertension in children. So, you know bleeding usually variceal bleeding in the form of hematemesis or you can have melina. So, usually bleeding is the most common presentation of portal hypertension in children. Bleeding is the most common presentation of portal hypertension in children. Other clinical features include splenomegaly. So, other clinical features are splenomegaly, ascites, evidence of liver dysfunction, growth failure, And if you know development of hepatopulmonary syndrome is there, then you can have cyanosis, clubbing, dyspnea cyanosis, clubbing, dyspnea if there is development of hepatopulmonary syndrome.
okay so that is about portal hypertension in children moving on to a little bit about viral hepatitis in children so we will not be discussing the parts that must have been covered in pathology or medicine so we will be mainly confining ourselves to the pediatrics aspect that is important from this topic okay the usual clinical features of viral hepatitis in children so these children will present with jaundice or icterus that means yellowness will be there which will be visible on the sclera on the skin okay buccal mucosa so jaundice will be there there will be tender hepatomegaly okay on examination you will get tender hepatomegaly there may be splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy so plus minus splenomegaly may be there lymphadenopathy may or may not be there okay and you can get some extra hepatic features sometimes as well like arthritis or rash which is more common in hepatitis b and c so you can get extra hepatic features like arthritis rash which are more common in hepatitis b or c okay now sometimes these children move on to acute liver failure in that case you can get so if there is development of acute liver failure you can get bleeding manifestations okay altered sensorium hyperreflexia and you can get you know unresponsiveness of prothrombin time to vitamin k elevated prothrombin time unresponsive to vitamin k indicate severe hepatic disease okay now moving on to a little bit about the individual hepatitis viruses which are important for us so hepatitis a it is a highly contagious disease and the route of transmission we know is the fecal oral route it is usually it presents with a acute illness okay the mean incubation period is around 3 weeks but the fecal excretion starts even before the clinical illness appears okay so it they remain infective for a long time right now about hepatitis b so hepatitis a you know it is a self limiting illness usually no treatment is required okay hepatitis b the incubation period is longer around 45 to 160 days mean being around 120 days okay now in children the most important risk factor for acquisition of hepatitis b is perinatal transmission from the mother so in children most important risk factor for acquisition of hepatitis b virus is perinatal exposure to hbsag positive mother and you know the risk of transmission is greatest if the mother is hbe antigen positive or if the viral load is very high okay so risk of transmission is further increased so risk of transmission is greatest if the mother is hbe antigen positive or the maternal viral load is very high high maternal hbv viral load another risk factor is the delivery of a previous baby who developed hepatitis b despite being given prophylaxis so another important risk factor is delivery of a prior infant who 
who developed hepatitis B despite prophylaxis. Okay. Now, what do you do for the profile axis of a baby who is born to a HBS antigen positive mother? Okay, so profile axis. So, what is recommended for the profile axis? For a baby who is born to a HBS AG positive mother. So, it is recommended that both hepat hepatitis B immunoglobulin. So, both hepatitis B immunoglobulin and hepatitis B vaccine should be given within 12 hours of delivery to be effective protection. Should be given within 12 hours of delivery. It prevents Hepatitis B infection in the baby in 95% cases. So, if you give it soon, within 12 hours, it will prevent hepatitis B infection in neonates in more than 95% cases if you give it timely. Okay. Now, a little bit about chronic hepatitis B. You know, the risk of developing chronic hepatitis B, risk of developing chronic hepatitis B. So, chronic hepatitis B means HBS antigen positive remaining for more than 6 months. Okay. So, chronic hep B means HBS antigen remaining positive for more than 6 months. So, this risk of developing chronic hepatitis B is related inversely to the age at which the infection is acquired. That means if the infection is acquired at a lesser age, more risk of chronic hepatitis B. Okay. So, risk of developing chronic hepatitis B is inversely related to the age of acquisition of infection. Okay, right. So that means the risk of X. So the risk of chronic Hep B in so in children less than one year, the risk of developing chronic Hep B is almost ninety percent. One to five years, it is around thirty percent, and for adults, it is around two percent. Okay. Now, apart from chronic hepatitis B, there is another uh, possibility that some children may develop fulminant hepatic failure. So, 1 to 5 percent cases may develop fulminant hepatitis. Okay, so 1 to 5 percent cases of hepatitis B may develop fulminant hepatitis which is a very very severe condition and the risk is increased if there is either co-infection or superinfection with hepatitis D virus. Risk increased if co-infection or superinfection with hepatitis D virus or if the host is immunocompromised or the patient is immunocompromised. Okay. Right. Now moving on to the treatment of hepatitis B in children. So treatment of hepatitis B in children. For acute hepatitis B, mainly it is the supportive care that is important. No specific treatment is required. Okay. So, for acute cases, 
the treatment is mainly supportive. For, but for chronic hepatitis B, for chronic hepatitis B, treatment is required for those individuals, treatment required for those individuals or those patients who have the immune active form of hepatitis B. So, treatment required for patients with immune active that means they will have the elevated liver enzymes okay some other evidence of liver dysfunction etc may be there so treatment required for patients with immune active form of disease and the drugs used include interferon alpha 2b so the drugs used include interferon alpha 2b pegylated interferon which is long acting pegylated interferon alpha 2 so drugs in use include interferon alpha 2b pegylated interferon can be used which is a long acting okay so less frequent injections may be required lamivudin can be used Drugs like adefovir, entecavir, tenofovir. So, these are useful in the treatment of chronic hepatitis B in children. Moving on to a little bit about hepatitis C in children. Now, again, in children, the most common mode of transmission of hepatitis C infection is perinatal. Most common mode of transmission is perinatal. And remember, hepatitis C is the most uh, common viral hepatitis to cause chronic hepatitis. Okay. So, most common hepatitis virus to cause chronic infection is again hepatitis C. Okay. Now again treatment is required if it is chronic hepatitis C. Acute cases usually do not require any specific treatment. So treatment for chronic hepatitis C Includes use of drugs like again pegylated interferon alpha 2b and ribavirin. Okay. Hepatitis D is not very uh, you know important as such, but it can be important as co infection or super infection with hepatitis B. Hepatitis E again is not very common in children. Okay. Hepatitis E has a fecal oral route of transmission, fecal oral transmission, and most severe illness is seen in pregnant females. Okay. More severe disease is seen in older individuals with hepatitis A. So in hepatitis E. So in children, hepatitis E is usually milder illness. Okay. More severe in so, affects older patients, more severe in pregnant females, okay. And hepatitis E as such is a more severe disease than hepatitis E. So, these are few things about viral hepatitis in children. Moving on to a little bit about a very important metabolic liver disease in children that is Wilson disease. So, this Wilson disease is, is an autosomal recessive condition, autosomal recessive due to the ATP7B gene mutation, ATP7B gene mutation seen on chromosome 13 Q14. As a result of that, there is decreased biliary copper excretion, okay. 
so there is decreased biliary copper excretion and accumulation of copper in hepatocytes accumulation of copper in hepatocytes okay now moving on to the clinical aspects of wilson's disease the clinical features that we can get it is a multi systemic illness and can involve various systems okay so in the liver we can get hepatomegaly can be there okay enlargement of the liver hepatomegaly hepatitis hepatic failure okay hepatomegaly hepatitis features of liver failure portal hypertension ascites okay involving the hematologic system we can get hemolytic anemia hemolytic anemia okay which is usually coombs negative in the cns so we can get some neurological involvement in the form of tremors dysarthria so tremors dysarthria dystonia chorea okay so abnormal movements can be there dystonia chorea okay and in the eye also we can get some manifestations like we can get something called kaiser flecher ring kf ring kf ring or the kaiser flecher ring and sunflower cataract sunflower cataract involving the renal system we can get fanconi syndrome renal failure okay so we can see lot of different systems in the body can be affected by wilson disease okay what are the findings that we get on investigation so we get decreased ceruloplasmin level decreased serum ceruloplasmin level the serum free copper level may be elevated but it is not very useful in diagnosis serum free copper level may be elevated urinary copper excretion is increased so urine copper levels will be high urinary copper excretion is increased okay the hepatic copper content is also high so if we do a liver biopsy and we put stains for copper so we'll get hepatic copper content more than 250 microgram per gram of dry liver weight and the kf ring which is visible on the slit lamp examination of eyes sometimes can be seen even with a can be seen even with a torch light so kf ring kaiser flecher ring the kaiser flecher ring on slit lamp examination of eye which is due to the deposition of copper okay in cornea is very important and helpful in diagnosis right what about the treatment of wilson disease so for the treatment of wilson disease we restrict dietary copper intake okay restrict 
dietary copper intake because copper transportation is not taking place properly okay restrict dietary copper intake which are the food which are rich in copper so avoid liver shellfish nuts chocolates nuts chocolates and for the treatment we can also use chelating agents okay we can use copper chelating agents like D-penicillamine, zinc can be used, okay, D-penicillamine, zinc or a newer drug that is triantine, any of them can be used. So that is about Wilson disease, a very important metabolic disease in children. Let us discuss one more disorder here which is actually not an inherited, you know, uh, inherited uh, metabolic disorder but it is a, an acquired metabolic disorder and that is Ray's syndrome. But because it is a metabolic disorder, we are including it here. An important metabolic disorder seen in children, Ray's syndrome, but it is an acquired disorder mostly. Okay. So, this Ray's syndrome is basically, it is acute metabolic disorder. It is an acute metabolic disorder resulting in generalized mitochondrial dysfunction. Acute metabolic disorder resulting in generalized mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction due to inhibition of fatty acid oxidation. Due to inhibition of fatty acid oxidation. This race syndrome is also known as Jamshedpur fever also known as Jamshedpur fever. Now what happens in Ray syndrome is there is fatty liver. Okay, So fatty liver is seen and there is encephalopathy or CNS involvement. So there is fatty liver and encephalopathy seen. Okay. Now, this encephalopathy is due to two reasons. One, because of cerebral edema and another is it is because of the hepatic impairment. So, hepatic encephalopathy. Okay. Ray syndrome is precipitated. Okay. The Ray syndrome is precipitated by. So, Ray syndrome is precipitate, can be precipitated by. drugs, some toxins, metabolic inborn errors of metabolism and some viruses like Coxsackie virus. Okay, it can be precipitated by viral infections like Coxsackie influenza virus, adenovirus, okay, varicella virus usually not precipitated by respiratory syncytial virus, okay, not by RSV, okay. Now, what happens in Ray syndrome is we said there is CNS involvement, there is fatty liver or liver involvement. So, you know the clinical features, so it is precipitated by these things and the clinical feature would be the child will have features of hepatic dysfunction, Features of hepatic dysfunction like hypoglycemia, okay, like bleeding manifestation. So, they can be prolonged for pro thrombin time because you know some of the coagulation factors we know are synthesized in liver, okay. So, bleeding manifestations can be there and prolonged prothrombin time can be there because of the hepatic dysfunction. But Jaundice is rare. So, you know, hepatic dysfunction without jaundice is a characteristic of Ray syndrome. So, you will get hepatic dysfunction, hepatomegaly, bleeding manifestations. Okay, there can be hypoglycemia, but jaundice is rare. If there is jaundice, we do not think of Ray syndrome. Okay, and 
because of CNS involvement, seizures and encephalopathy are usually seen. Seizures and encephalopathy seen. In fact, seizure is a very common feature seen in more than 80% of the patients. Seizures and encephalopathy seen. Okay. Seizures usually occur in more than 80% patients. Okay. So, that is the clinical presentation of Ray syndrome. So, from a given scenario, how do you diagnose Ray syndrome? So, suppose you are getting a case scenario in your exam that you know a 3 year male child, it can be a female as well, with fever for 5 days was given some medication. So, you know medications like aspirin, NSAIDs precipitate Ray syndrome. Okay, NSAIDs precipitate. So, among the precipitants we can add NSAIDs precipitate Ray syndrome. Okay. So, a 3 year old male with fever for 5 days was given some medication. NSAIDs may or may not be mentioned in the question and he developed anorexia, vomiting, anorexia, vomiting, altered sensorium, seizures. On investigation, was found to have hypoglycemia, say blood glucose of 35, okay, hypoglycemia, prolonged prothrombin time. Okay, and you know, on examination, it may be mentioned that no jaundice, but hepatomegaly seen. So, in this situation, your diagnosis would be Ray syndrome. Okay. So, what are the pointers in the favor of diagnosis of Ray syndrome? So, here what you have is a, a child, okay, 3 year old male child, fever was there. He was given some medication, history of aspirin may or may not be given, okay, and said if it is given, it goes more in favor of the diagnosis. Developed anorexia, vomiting, altered sensorium seizures, very, very common in Ray syndrome. No jaundice, but hepatomegaly seen. So, there is liver impairment without jaundice that again goes in favor, hypoglycemia, okay. So, all these go in the favor of Ray syndrome. So, you know, Ray syndrome is a very, very severe disorder where despite best supportive care, it carries a poor prognosis and mortality risk of 25 to 70%. So, prognosis poor and their mortality in. So, there is no specific treatment actually, it's supportive care is to be given, but mortality is seen in 25 to 70% cases. Okay. So, that is about Ray's syndrome, a very important metabolic disorder that can be seen in children.